This week on Downstream, can the latest smartwatches win over Asia? Why Wikipedia is suing the US National Security Agency? We take you on a joyride from the future and inside the world's most complex science experiment. Hi there, I'm Tarek Basley and this is Downstream, the week's top science and technology stories on Al Jazeera. Well, will 2015 be the year of the smartwatch? Technology giants like Apple and smaller startups as well want the answer to that question to be a resounding yes. And they've been flooding the market with new and increasingly sophisticated and stylish models. The explosion of watches, the most prominent of which is the Apple Watch, could mark the arrival of a whole new category in the consumer electronics market. The new ones are less like having a mini smartphone strapped to your wrist and more like a traditional wristwatch. Some offer push-to-talk functions, other have GPS panic buttons for emergencies. But the big question is whether people will buy them. There's some really great things you can do. You can do turn-by-turn -turn navigation without having to pull your smartphone out. The, the voice dictation is really clever and some of the apps are really quite compelling. But they are expensive and the battery life doesn't last long enough. And while they will become a really great category in the future, it's, it's a good year or two yet away from that now. And that ambivalence appears to be matched on the streets of Hong Kong. The technology now is so advanced, it will be able to do so many more things and be far more convenient. Whatever function the smartwatch does, the smartphone already does it, it's just smaller. If it was really pretty, I would consider it. But for girls, it has to be sparkly. <laughs> Smart watchmakers have also used the health and fitness tracking features on the devices as a selling point. Specialist activity tracking bands have become big business, with more than 70 million sold last year. And watchmakers are hoping their products will attract some of these buyers. The fitness market, the fitness trackers, sport watches, that's already an industry in itself and the smartwatch is going to eventually absorb it because everything converges and that's the best thing for the tech industry. I think right now you've got running watches which are really great and they're really good at what they do and that's not going to go away anytime soon. Fitness trackers are starting to lose their edge because why do you need a fitness tracker once you've found out how many steps you do every day? You know, there's, it's gamifying it with no victory. So it's, it's eventually that will go into a smartwatch and that can be a part of the experience. It just really depends when the smartwatch can get good enough in terms of battery life, in terms of cost and design, and then everything will come together and all those great bits of all of them will be in one place. If you've ever wondered what the joyride of the future will be like, well, one version of it's been on display in London this week. It's called Neurosis, and it's been developed by Thrill Laboratory, a grouping of scientists, artists, designers and engineers working on new forms of thrilling experience. Phil Lavelle met the lab's director, Brendan Walker. Neurosis is the first brain control ride in the world. We get a rider, we put them with a, a brain monitoring cap, they sit in our motion platform and their brain data is used to create an immersive virtual reality world which then they tumble through in their motion platform but also wearing some virtual reality headset they actually get this immersive 3D experience as well. And if they're able to control their brain waves, their thoughts, then halfway through the ride, they start to get a better experience. So it's all about being able to control the, your mind, to be able to control your ride experience. And of course, for the audience, there's a whole light and sound show that goes along with it. It's a bit like theater. Are you trying to say that this is what the future will hold? Will we wear these kind of virtual reality masks all day? In theme parks today, our bodies are the limitations of what we can actually do. Now people are looking at other ways to create thrills and I believe that's inside people's minds. So if I can actually tap inside people's heads using emotive like EEG brain sets, then I think I can unlock a completely new layer of experience for the future. EEG brain set, so explain yeah. to us what that is. Yeah. An EEG brain set actually monitors 14 channels of electricity on your head. So each one's got a tiny little sensor which monitors micro fluctuations in the electricity inside your brain. So if this part of the brain, which is to do with making sense of shapes, starts firing up, I'll be able to monitor that. So I can very quickly get a good idea of how your brain's responding to my ride experience and then change it to adapt it specifically for you. 
We'd love to hear from you if you have any suggestions of science or technology stories we should be covering here on Al Jazeera. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at Tarek Basley or make a comment on this post. Still to come this week, are Facebook standards your standards? We take a look at the latest content rules. And in search of dark matter, we take a tour of the Large Hadron Collider. Now though, some of the other technology stories of the week. Google have now brought the 360 degree street view experience to YouTube videos. By steering the video with your mouse or touch, a viewer can explore out of frame shots that add an element of immersion to typical viewing. Legendary European festival Tomorrowland is the focus of one such 360 degree video. And NASA are crowdsourcing the search for unidentified asteroids. With the help of a purpose-built computer application and a newly developed scanning algorithm, stargazers can scan the night sky for clues. NASA claims its new algorithm is 15% more effective than previous attempts. Bringing the crowd and 360 degree video together, a Spanish company specialising in high altitude balloon technology is seeking to crowdfund a balloon trip over the Arctic on March the 20th, on board a cluster of GoPro cameras to capture the rare sight of a total solar eclipse from a rare vantage point in complete 360 degree HD quality. It only happens over the North Pole once every 500,000 years, which means next time round there may not be ice covering the Arctic. This is a very challenging flight because of the conditions up there. The meteorological conditions first, there will be a lot of uh, wind probably and the balloon might go very far so it might be very difficult to recover. Um, the other conditions are of course the ice and snow and the polar bears. Um, so our team is already there and we're going to try to make it happen uh, to fly a small balloon with six GoPros exactly at the time of the eclipse and then recover it. Social media website Facebook has published new detailed rules about what content's okay and what's banned on its network. It says it wants its 1.4 billion users to feel safe while online and has created the guidelines to help people understand better what content may be reported and removed. It won't allow groups engaged in what it calls terrorist activity or organised crime. And any content expressing support or praise for banned groups or their leaders is also prohibited. Facebook's also stopping content that appears to be purposefully targeting private individuals with the intention of degrading or shaming them. This includes photos and videos and the sharing of personal information to blackmail or harass people. On the issue of nudity, Facebook's also banned images of female breasts if the nipple's visible, but there are some exceptions such as women who are breastfeeding. Photos of artwork featuring nudity are allowed, but not digitally created content unless it's posted for educational humor humorous or satirical purposes? Well, I, th I think the truth is that um, inevitably, uh, depending on the, the topic or content that you're dealing with, um, there are different responses. And, and I, I think one thing's for sure is that they do listen a lot to their users. And users, if, for example, um, you look at their use of video, their introduction of interstitials around content that may be controversial or violent, we think is a very good m move in response to uh, users. I think there is an argument that perhaps they ought to um, uh, work more closely with content providers to perhaps provide them in to with tools themselves to, to do that kind of thing. But on the whole, we felt that was a very good move, particularly with autoplay facilities um, on news feeds these days. So I think that's just one example of how they're responding to the, uh, the sensitivities of, of their users, but also um, to preserve a, a degree of, of respect and context around it. It's the world's most complex science experiment and in the coming days the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva will be up and running again after being offline for around two years. In that time it's been upgraded, scientists hope it will now be able to operate at twice the power and by doing so give us an even deeper understanding of our universe and just possibly a glimpse of the hypothetical matter known as dark matter. Well last year I had a chance to visit the facility. A hundred metres below the surface, technicians are putting the final touches on an upgrade to the world's most advanced physics experiment. 
The Large Hadron Collider sends tiny particles through pipes at speeds just shy of the speed of light at almost 300,000 kilometres a second. But an initial design flaw stopped the machine from running at full power. During the first three years, we ran only at half energy for TV, which was nevertheless uh, sufficient to find the X boson, for, for instance, or, and many other things. But physicists want to, to go higher and uh, have more energetic uh, particle and energetic collision. To do this, the experiment was switched off, and then each section was rebuilt and meticulously tested. Well, much of the focus of this upgrade has been on strengthening 1,700 of these copper linking cables. They're important because they connect the huge electromagnets inside these pipes. The electromagnets are very important to the experiment because they direct the beam of particles as it travels along this 27 kilometer long loop. At full speed, particles travel around that loop 11,000 times a second. Then they're put on a collision course with a second beam travelling around the pipe in the opposite direction. The high energy collisions that result are then analysed to see what they reveal about how particles inside the atom behave. We can look for whole new particles, maybe there's dark matter particles out there uh, which are just a bit too heavy so that we can't make them only at the energy we've been at so far. We need to hit things together harder in order to explore those bigger mass or larger energy regimes. Discoveries from the experiment have already given us a better understanding of our physical world. The knowledge has also been used in medicine to develop new treatments for cancer and other applications are expected in the years ahead. With an increase in power, the researchers say those possibilities become even greater. News this week that online encyclopedia Wikipedia is joining in a lawsuit against the US National Security Agency over its mass surveillance program. Wikipedia says the NSA has been tapping into the backbone of the internet, sucking up the contents of phone calls and emails. It says this behaviour violates the first and fourth amendments of the US Constitution. We believe that the uh, upstream surveillance, the mass surveillance, of um, our readers and users is damaging to us. Uh, Wikipedia depends on a culture of openness and courage uh, for people to be able to participate. Uh, and in that context, their privacy is very important. Obviously, they try to keep as much of this under wraps as possible. Uh, but the information that Edward Snowden has released uh, tells us very strongly that they are surveilling almost everything they can get their hands on uh, with respect to communications between uh, U.S. citizens and foreigners. And uh, they have a very weak standard for determining uh, what is and is not uh, within their realm of collection. Well, the harm is fairly clear. Wikipedia depends on people being able to speak their minds, uh, being able to speak privately. Uh, you know, the, the importance of Wikipedia to the world is that it's a place where people can come together and have a serious discussion about issues that really matter from history, science, politics, technology, whatever it might be. Uh, this kind of surveillance of everyone uh, is incredibly damaging to that mission. Well, we're very confident that we can overcome the hurdles that have, uh, that have prevented previous cases. Uh, one of the biggest issues has been the question of standing. Uh, in other words, finding a plaintiff to come forward and say, look, I'm being surveilled, um, we are being surveilled, uh, and this is impacting us. Um, we definitely have standing. Uh, there's no question about that. And so we think the case will proceed, and when we think about it uh, on the merits, uh, you look at what the law says, you look at what the Constitution says, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we are in the right here. That's it for this week. I hope you'll share this video and have a look at the Al Jazeera English website, aljazeera.com. You'll find all our previous shows there. You can also follow me, Tarek Basley, on Twitter, at Tarek Basley. Thanks for watching. Till next time, goodbye.